Thank you very much, uh, Alan. Um, if anyone wants to react during this conference, I just want to remind you that you can also react and, and Twitter using the hashtag StrongerTogetherBE. So, so it's uh, also on the booklet, eh? on the right-hand upper corner, you have this account. Uh, and I, I would also like to thank the EGD for uh, making available this beautiful conference hall because this is not evident. We have to book it long in advance. And as I see the number of participants, uh, we really needed this, this big conference hall. So uh, really thank you for facilitating this. And I would like to, to introduce eh, Dr. Uh, Brad Strickland. Um, and if I look at your CV, uh, Brad, I see that you're a living example of lifelong learning eh? <laughs> in practice. So that's uh, good that we have someone like you for to share a, a few of your uh, experiences today. Um, I will just take a grasp from, from your CV. Eh? Um, I see that you, you, you have been in Zambia in Eastern Zambia. I was there at the same time, but in another province eh, in the early 90s, uh, doing a PhD research on improving rural health and, and education. And then you, you worked for the USAID Africa Bureau uh, of, on the education team for about uh, eight years until 2004. Uh, and then you served as the chair of the UNESCO-led interagency task team on HIV and education. Uh, and as well as coordinator of the education working group of the, the Clinton Global Initiative uh, on the Dahita Action Network. Uh, you were director for the American Institute of Research in terms of uh, the director of outreach and communications. And uh, for the past five years, you have been working at the development division at Creative Associates yeah, until 2017, as I memory as well. And now you're an independent consultant advising on school health and inclusion. And your experience is really in the field of international development, more specifically on multi-sectoral health and education programs, really on this intersection, uh, social behavior change as an anthropologist. Yeah? And uh, you also have uh, experience with private sector partnerships for development. Please complete if I omitted something important, eh? but the floor is yours. Carol, thank you very much for that kind introduction. And I, of course, I was just gonna say thank you. And while you're doing that, I think my too. I, I would like to thank you also because you've been instrumental in getting me here. And I, I'm very impressed with the venue. Um, Ellen, uh, thank you also for your comments. The clear description of facts and priorities for this intersection between our two sectors is given very clearly by you. I, we have, uh, I've been working at the Global Partnership for Education for the last few months, and the fact sheet and the infographic, all the materials that are actually on that website uh, recite much of the same justification. My title at uh, Global Partnership for Education is Health and Inclusion, and much of the justification for working in health within the education sector and in schools is focused under equity and inclusion and gender in specific. So as we go through today talking more about specific activities and applications of health within the education sector, I think uh, it, it may come forward. Um, it, it may seem obvious. If it doesn't, uh, I would invite people to ask questions. I said to Carol as we're getting started, I, I'm, I'm an anthropologist by training. He and I overlapped in Zambia. I was in the bush in the early 1990s living in uh, rural villages. I dress like a bureaucrat now because I'm living and working in bureaucracy in Washington. But in fact, I'm much more comfortable in the village still in sub-Saharan Africa, either in Zimbabwe or Zambia or Malawi. So I would like to have uh, the discussion today be as uh, interactive as it can be. I've got slides prepared, and if you would like to ask questions that bear off of them, that's fine too. Um, Ellen, I would also like to extend my gratitude to Deputy Prime Minister De Croo and the uh, Ministry of Development Cooperation, VBOB, for all of their support 
on this particular nexus of uh, interests, I, make, I made some effort to get here, and I would make some effort to do it again, uh, whether it were in Brussels or in Harare or in Lusaka or in uh, Cambodia. The uh, opportunity to actually talk about the importance of this intersection between education and health uh, is rare, to actually have an audience of this size. It doesn't happen very often. And we're very fortunate to have the opportunity today. I'm, I'm so glad to see such a good turnout, and I'm very happy to be here. And I thank uh, Educade and Because Health both for all of their support getting me here today and for bringing this conference together. So I played with various titles for what I would, my, my key remarks. Um, but I really think we are talking about promoting cross-sector linkages in health and education. There are very clear ways to do this. They're, they're very, it's an incredibly important time to be talking about it. The stars are aligning. We should be able to move this forward. It has been, I've been working on this for, well, uh, towards 30 years now. Um, and Dr. Drake, who's on a panel later on, she and I, along with Dr. Uh, Professor Bundy at uh, London School of Tropical hygiene and medicine. We've been working on this a long time, and we'll cover some of the key frameworks that go forward, but the time has never been better to work on cross-sector linkages in education and health, health and education, however we want to frame it. Um, and I think we need to really seize this opportunity and push forward in a very practical way. It is, it is, there are practical ways to do that, and there's no reason for us not to do it. Let's see, this is, just going forward, okay. I thought first I would uh, give you a quick overview of what to expect from my slides and presentation. We can take it off in another direction if you would prefer. I'm going to talk a little bit about the cross-sectoral frameworks globally that we're all in education and health been working with, the MDGs and the SDGs where we got our license to focus on these things and the real drive and mandate to do it. We have new sources of evidence. They're not um, necessarily all new research articles, but compiled in new places, new ways to promote the cross-sectoral linkage in education and health. Uh, DCP3, Disease Control Priorities, this third edition, which has just been launched uh, in the last few months, is an incredibly important resource. Volume eight itself is dedicated to education and health. It's dedicated to child and adolescent health priorities and using the school as a platform for uh, focus on school-aged children. It's incredibly useful and, and we really need to capitalize on the presence of this volume, I think. And I can make that recommendation in all confidence. We also have new modalities in development assistance and I'll talk more about that. And then part of the rationale for those modalities is the massive scale. Global population is, is, is enormous. The number of youth and the, num the amount of need is enormous. There's no way we can do this without really talking about taking things to scale, which we need to be doing clearly. And finally, because I am a village-based anthropologist, I have to put something in about community-level excitement. If this doesn't resonate in households in rural parts of the world, we've completely failed. It doesn't matter how clever, how technically precise our interventions are. If parents, children, teachers aren't excited about what they're doing on health activities in schools, it, it, they won't even show up. It, there's no reason to even be doing it unless we really are thinking about the needs at the community level and making sure that programs are relevant and resonate with families. So, about my own background, I've said enough about being a, a village field-based anthropologist, um, but I, I will confess, I am primarily, I've worked mostly in the education sector since going from the village to <laughs> development work, and my bias is in the education sector. But when we talk about cross-sectoral programs in health and education, I don't think uh, we can get away from dealing with the education sector. As Carol said, both of these sectors have incredibly important roles to play uh, in this cross-sectoral focus, and the technical spe specialization that is needed in both for delivery of services is immeasurable. One, one cannot discount that in any way. 
someone like myself who's focusing on the collaboration between the two sectors, um, we have a role to play, but it's not the same as a health practitioner. It's not the same as a teacher. There are people doing very specific things, and we need all of them to participate when we strategize what the priorities are at community level and school level. Um, I will point out that most of this, uh, the frameworks that we refer to date back to 1986. That's sort of the, the starting point for uh, the Ottawa Charter for Health that was out of WHO, but it really was focused primarily on uh, community public health outcomes. It wasn't really focused on schools. It did say that we need to focus on uh, multi-sectoral approaches, but it didn't give much guidance on how to do that. The, oops, sorry. The UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, of course, is the second big uh, framework that, that motivates us all to focus on uh, education and health, both as universal human rights of children. Then WHO in 1995 uh, launches the Health Promoting Schools Framework, which is a very important uh, tool for focusing on what specific health needs of school-aged children can be effectively addressed through schools, although WHO is not talking specifically about doing this in schools. It's talking about using schools as a way to affect community-wide health outcomes, which I think is, from my experience, probably the most common way that working with health sector and health and education works. It's uh, a, a very commendable and important and needed focus on community level impacts and how schools can be used to, to deliver that, to do that. It's not necessarily focused on the health of school-aged children, which is an area we will continue to come back to. Um, of course, child-friendly schools uh, at UNICEF, if anyone is familiar with working in the education sector, knows that that's a very important framework for addressing the entire education experience of children, <coughs> the school environment, and it, it has mandates for working on health and healthy environments and teaching healthy behaviors. Um, that's late 90s, and finally, at 2000, UNESCO launches FRESH, the Focusing Resources for Effective School Health Framework, which finally actually uh, it, it comes on the wake of the International School Health Initiative that the World Bank was pushing. Uh, Professor Bundy was leading that. And when FRESH is launched at UNESCO, it, it's the first time, along with uh, the Dakar Educa World Education Forum in Dakar, universal primary education says to the world, we really have to focus on school age, the health of school aged children. There's n no point in delivering education if we're not gonna talk about health at the same time, and it needs to be in schools. So FRESH has actually four pillars that help a ministry identify the specific uh, focuses for health interventions at school level, equitable school health policies, safe learning environments, skills-based health education, health and nutrition services. And we can talk more about examples of each of those as we go along. I will point out that Fresh, having been going now for 18 years, practically 20, has developed a number of materials. I, I will put this out somewhere so we can make it available. The Fresh has indicators to measure health uh, activities in schools and progress on uh, policies promoting health activities. The World Bank also has another system for measuring the policy environment, uh, SEBER systems approach to basic education reform. And it measures specifically the policy environment and whether it's uh, emergent or established. So it's, it's pretty easy to be able to ask, I think we need, we need to ask ministries of education where we're working on health activities and want to work with schools, where does the ministry stand in the development of its policy environment for health activities? Is it, is it well established? Um, is it emergent? Do they, is, is there a policy? Do people know where it is? If we ever get audited, if any of us get audited, the first thing the auditors want to know is, can you find the materials? Well, where are the policies? Can, can you find them, access them, and pull them up? In many cases, the answer is no. I'll talk a little bit more about the work that I've been doing with the Global Partnership for Education, looking at the education sector plans scanned through 67 different country education plans. It's an enormous amount of work, 
only 12 of those. We have 52 plans that are showing signs of activities, important activities being done that focus on school health and the health needs of school-aged children, but only 12 that actually reference some organized framework or plan to justify doing those activities. So th th this is something that's very important. We need to all be thinking about uh, in the course of the day, how, how do we help ministries uh, identify and develop those plans? They're really good resources, including fresh to do that. There's no, no real justification apart from people simply not having uh, the knowledge or political will to do it in the education sector. But we can, we can make a big difference and we can really help do that. So <clears throat> I thought I would focus for a, a minute on the MDGs and the important outcome that we saw from those and then the transition to the SDGs. There are uh, professionals working in education, Alice Albright, the CEO at uh, Global Partnership for Education, is actually quite fond of pointing out there's been tremendous progress made on the education goal from the MDGs, which was actually a call for focus on universal primary education. And there's been tremendous pro progress made on goal number four from the MDGs, reducing child mortality, under five child survival. And those of us who are familiar with the health sector know exactly what that means. Uh, maternal mortality has dropped radically. Child survival has improved dramatically. The MDGs shined a real light on those things and there were tremendous gains made. But that's the foundation. It's, it's, it's only part of the equation and this is Alice Albright's point. The SDGs push us to really focus now on a much more synergistic approach to doing these things that force us to innovate in ways that the MDGs simply threw the goals out there now, uh, SDG, two, three, four, five, and six. If I go to those, reducing hunger, I don't know, can you actually see those? You probably see them better on the screen than I can see them on my paper. Um, three, of course, is focused on health. Four is focused on basic education. Five on gender equality. And six focused on clean water and sanitation. And school health activities, education and health, as, as we would refer to it, really directly supports each of those one, two, three, four, five SDGs. There are some working in school health who are real uh, proponents of saying, no, school health supports all 17 SDGs. And that, in, in some ways, that is true. But credibly, realistically, we can talk about those five having direct support and we can cite those and point to them and make very practical uh, links between things that are being done in schools that support specific SDGs, like the, the hunger one. It's a, it's a real time need when kids come to school hungry and when they are actually fed. One's addressing those things instantly. Daniel Boasi, who was the director of uh, the provincial uh, minister of education in Eastern province, um, said to me once when there was a deworming and school feeding program going on in his schools, and he said, you know, they do quality inputs on textbooks, teacher training, there are all kinds of things that are done that improve the quality of education, but that deworming and school feeding was the only time he can say he actually saw overnight the transition in a child and their ability to attend school and actually participate. And he said in this particular case that he pointed out to me, it was a girl, and he said she went from being lethargic at the back of the class to being at the front of the class, raising her hand, asking questions, participating. Her entire cognitive development was turned around from a simple health intervention like feeding and deworming. There are many things like that that then the repercussions for the fifth SDG and promoting gender equality in communities, which it's immeasurable. It, it all begins at school. There's no way around it. Whether community attitudes ever, uh, there are different perceptions and behaviors around women's empowerment and gender equality. 
access is only part of the, the problem for basic education, and the SDGs are really trying hard to help us get there. So we've got the SDGs pushing us. We've got frameworks, all of which are aligning to help us really focus our cross-sectoral work on health and education in ways that are very practical. And I, I, I will point to a blog that's on the GPE website that I actually wrote, <laughs> which highlights specific health interventions that we found in the education sector plans. They're very specific and link directly to uh, one of the five SDGs. So I, I can't, I, I, I will leave it to people to go read those. I could go through some of them myself, but there's not a lot of point. We could ask questions and have more productive conversation, I'm sure. So <clears throat> my point, I think, there is to say um, we have new, new sources of evidence. I'll talk more about DCP3. We've got these frameworks in place, but we also have these changing realities. Over the last 25, 30 years that I've been working on these issues, there's been a complete transformation in things that we have to focus on. Um, the HIV epidemic has crested, and many people who were not before on treatment are on treatment. The need now, of course, there's still a great need for prevention education. And having worked with the UNAIDS task team on HIV and education, I will never stop talking about the need for HIV prevention education and comprehensive sexuality education as an important foundation for HIV prevention education. There's my plug for the IATT, and it's it, it, people who want to work on health and education can look directly there at life skills education, HIV prevention education, comprehensive sexuality education, because it is a very um, ill-supported nexus of issues that have a tremendous place in the future of the global community. Uh, they, they don't, they, IATT itself uh, at UNESCO is working on fumes. I don't know how many people have been working with uh, UNAIDS and the HIV prevention education programs globally, but it, they, need, they need our support. We really need to roll up our sleeves and, and get busy at the community level and the school level and the ministerial level and even at the UN level if we can. So. I was speaking with someone um, from the hotel to here this morning talking about this burgeoning phenomenon of uh, epidemic of obesity globally. There are changing realities that are morphing uh, daily that we could not have imagined. We've been focused uh, very much on stunting, malnutrition, and hunger as problems at school, but now we also have to be able to focus on obesity and a host of non-infectious disease problems that simply didn't exist. They weren't the problem that they are today. Cancers, TB, respiratory illness, cardiovascular illnesses, um, blood pressure. These were things that we weren't worried so much about in school health 20 years ago, and we have to focus on them now. They're systemic issues that require systemic solutions, systemic uh, analysis and it requires the input of both sectors, education and health, in order to be able to affect uh, education programs at school level that really tackle these problems. They will have education benefits, benefit education outcomes, but they will also have community-wide outcomes for public health concerns, and that's one of the key issues that we need to keep thinking about, that we can very easily satisfy outcomes on both sides for both sectors, education and health. I would, of course, reference again, and I will hold up one of my props, the new DCP3, Disease Control Priorities 3, third edition, um, is a very important resource. Um, I will go to this slide which Dr. Drake will recognize, having worked herself with uh, me on the prologue for this particular edu education edition, but uh, there are a host of authors who have been involved 
with the uh, production of the chapters in this DCP-3, the third edition. The first edition, um, well, the first edition was the World Development Report in 1993, which uh, Bill Gates actually points out was one of the fundamental uh, resources that inspired him to create the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and tackle, try to tackle so many of the global health problems that we're all still working on. Um, then there was a DCP-2, the second edition in blue, which was expanded and focused on uh, a wider range of illnesses, but it's not until we get to DCP-3 that we actually have uh, eight volumes, not sorry, nine volumes, that focus on essential surgery, reproductive and child health, cancer. The fourth volume is mental, neurological, and substance abuse. And the fifth volume focuses on cardiovascular, respiratory, and related diseases. Volume six focuses on major infectious disease. Volume seven on injury prevention and environmental issues. And volume eight, finally, on child and adolescent development. Well, many of the articles that are in there have been worked on for the last decade. The evidence is building up its, its I don't even know how to describe it, it's irrefutable. It's in, in common parlance, we say it's a no-brainer. The evidence says, do this, you have these outcomes. The new work on uh, neurodevelopment and brain plasticity makes it very clear. The window for intervening in neural development of children is much wider than people thought before. Where we've been focusing uh, with great success on the first thousand days, it actually, are, people are now saying it, it requires 8,000, 7,000 more until a person reaches 21 years of age. Brain development at pivotal moments, uh, nutrition interventions at school actually can trigger full brain development and uh, Elena Gregorenko is one of the uh, best neuroscientists that we have at uh, her research that's in DCP3 um, focuses specifically on the amount of brain development that continues occurring until age of 21 so we, we have no reason to abandon kids in primary school uh, at all. I, and I, I really don't understand when I think about the, the global emphasis on literacy and numeracy, which is admirable. Of course, kids have to be able to read and write. But what is the point if we're not feeding and allowing brains to develop in ways that can actually uh, accomplish these things? It really, it really is a no-brainer by now. So we'll make this available, I'm sure, so you can see it, because it's hard to see. The, the essential packages, this is one of the key messages of DCP3 Volume 8, that there are costed essential packages for the stages of a child's life from age 5 to the early 20s that allow for a focus at school level. They're costed out so a ministry knows what they cost. And this is what research is telling us through DCP3, all of the articles that are assembled, these are the things that need to be done to affect uh, the most pressing child uh, school-age needs of children and can be done through schools. So I've put this on the board. It's on uh, an infographic at GPE, the Global Partnership for Education. And I recommend everyone going to that. It's incredibly useful. Uh, it's very useful to educators to be able to advocate for services at schools, and it's very useful to the health sector to be able to say these are the things we really need to be focusing on. Then I wanted to mention something about the new modalities that uh, I have referenced. We have, I, I think the Global Partnership is a prime example. We also have the Global Fund for HIV, TB, and Malaria. We've got now the Global Financing Facility at the World Bank, which is, I understand, really taken hold of financing massive uh, investments in the health sector. I saw this morning an email referring to the Edu International Education Financing Facility, which I'm not quite sure whether Gordon Brown has been working on. We have multiple new 
modalities, uh, MDG 8 was calling for uh, new global partnerships for development, and that's what we're getting. We're, we're seeing them in, in big numbers. Global Partnership for Education assembles 67, well, 65 formal member countries who are all submitting their education sector plans and applying for specific amounts of funds. They can actually, uh, after getting a small grant to develop a sector analysis and a sector plan, they can then apply for up to $100 million to actually implement an education sector plan. So these are, these are extraordinary, new, extraordinary new facilities, modalities to deliver uh, development assistance, which some of them are being used to implement health activities in education as well. So the uh, scan of education sector plans that I've been involved with, we found a, a very wide variety of health activities, which we can, of course, make available later for people to look at as well. And we found the distribution in education sector plans actually quite predictable. School feeding probably has the largest number proportion. Then um, water and sanitation, including latrines and toilets, would, is next. Then, of course, HIV prevention education and mitigation services, reproductive health education, and deworming. These were the, the primary activities we found across all education sector plans. And as I noted, we found them distributed in 52 of the 67 different plans that we scanned, which is really remarkable. And I think the, the key thing, I am now running up against time, and I'm going to try to be more concise. Um, at the World Bank meetings, spring meetings, just earlier this month, Julia Gillard, the former Prime Minister of Australia, pointed out, she, she said the, the number one message we need to take away from those meetings was the need for a massive response. Global population, there are 1.8 billion kids the age of 15 to 29, so it's not exactly the school age population, it's even larger. If we think about the school age population up to age 21, she, she was pointing to the fact that, you know, focusing on a few hundred thousand kids or even a million kids is, is not enough to tackle the scale of intervention that we actually need to be undertaking. And I, I believe firmly we're, we're going there. We have to keep pushing on it and identifying these facilities and to, to deliver development assistance. But then I still come back to the point I made earlier. If it's not exciting to communities and kids and parents and teachers at, at local level, what's the point? They, you'll, you, we could spend all of our time inventing this massive uh, level of response. And if it's not actually useful at community level, then we really haven't done anything at all. So I'll finally conclude and bring it uh, back to a base. I told Carol I had two different endings. I could go, I could skip over this couple of slides, which focuses on institutional level support to ministries of education specifically and how uh, bilaterals like uh, the Belgian Ministry for Development Cooperation or USAID or DFID can support through local missions working with ministries of education. The next two slides I have after these two are focused on ministries working with communities and how a development agency can actually help foster that relationship. But I think this is probably a step that we really need to focus on for the next 10 to 20 years, and that is helping ministries decide how they're going to focus within the education sector. And I have um, props again. This is uh, something that I had worked on in 2011, which is still completely current. It has very clear, easy steps for um, working with the Ministry of Education to develop frameworks to help a ministry identify its own prioritization. Um, and the, the steps I really wanted to focus on the most are facilitating that strong cross-sectoral policy environment between education and health, which in many cases, you know from working at field level, may not exist at all. 
Um, and it's not for lack of, it, it, I think it's often lack of, lack of knowledge, lack of understanding what resources are available to build that relationship. People get very focused on developing the technical specialization that they've been trained to deliver, and it needs to be done, but the collaboration between the sectors can't be neglected. So developing uh, also and helping the ministry explore the global frameworks that do exist. The two that I've mentioned today, again, the, the FRESH program, they're good teaching uh, resources for teachers on FRESH. They're great resources to actually organize and help a ministry prioritize what they would like to do through schools. And now, thanks to DCP3 and Volume 8, we have essential packages identified specifically that can be done in schools. It doesn't, and we have the evidence to back it now. So the framework exists, and now we've got the evidence to justify exactly what's in the framework, too. And there is no reason to avoid it. There's no reason not to do it. The SDGs are telling us we have to. So I, I'm not quite sure. We, I, think, I think we just have to recommit ourselves to it and work on it. Um, the final thing that I would point out is it's on step number seven up there, working with the existing systems and infrastructure in education. I think it's often neglected um, by health practitioners where, like I said, very committed to delivering the services we've been trained in our specializations to deliver and working on behavior change at community level. Well, ministries of education have spent an awful lot of time developing pre-service teacher training education for teachers, professionalization and standards for teachers, and they can't be abandoned. So there's got to be some focus on how to bring the health specializations together with the teaching specializations, education work, to actually bring that uh, to a, a harm harmonious collaboration. I think we have an awful lot. The frameworks are there. We have the obviously the will and all the people that are in this room today. It's indicative. There's growing awareness at the World Bank and the bilateral organizations, at Global Partnership for Education and Financing Facility. It's it's uh, well as I said. It seems it seems to me like a no-brainer. We have no reason not to do it, except uh, we we might have to advocate for resources to focus on these things in particular in the cross-sectoral linkages. And with that, I would like to pass it back to you, Carol, and conclude. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brad. It was very inspiring, very rich, I would say. And as you say, uh, uh, a non-brainer. Uh, so there's a lot of things which are there, uh, frameworks, uh, uh, evidence, eh? but there might be need for uh, resources and also rolling up the sleeves eh? at, at every level. So this is becoming a, a reality together with the communities in the households that it's making a change at that level. Eh? Um, looking at time, as you said already, time is not with us, but I would like to give a small opportunity, if I may, to for one or two questions. Eh? Um, of course, we have coffee break, we have lunchtime, so you can interact directly with Brad, but if there are some questions, eh, one or two, please go ahead. Yes, one. Uh, thanks, Brad, for that really rich presentation. Something I was quite uh, surprised by and interested in was uh, the recommendation, I think in the uh, DC, uh, D, you call it DCP3, um, that comprehensive sexuality education uh, should start at 10 years old. Um, and I'm just wondering what your thoughts on that, because uh, from, from my perspective and, and what I know is that comprehensive sexuality education should start much younger, uh, uh, even in kindergarten. So I'm just wondering what the thought process was with that and how that recommendation came to be. Thanks. I think I recognize Yona down there. And I, th you know, those are one of those questions, Yona, <clears throat> who you're with Plan, correct? Yes. Um, in my experience working in sub-Saharan Africa, this is one of those questions that 
I, and I would, I'm venturing to guess, I would have to go back and reread the exact chapter uh, where the evidence is from those. I know that the CSE uh, components have not been costed. They, that's one of the areas that still needs more research for costing. There isn't enough evidence yet. I do know that it's one of the most sensitive issues for uh, an address at community level. And I'm assuming that the authors are working to handle that as carefully as possible. I know UNESCO is in total agreement with what you're suggesting. And the work that I've done with the interagency task team on HIV and education, everyone would say exactly the same. It needs to happen uh, earlier in primary schools. The fact is when, uh, I think it was a UNICEF conference in Zambia on comprehensive sexuality education a couple of years ago that I attended, there was very vocal opposition to any sexuality education at any level of primary school. And that level of community response, we, we can't ignore it either. Um, those were very powerful and well-informed and well-educated uh, local parents and NGOs that were making that case. So I, I would, if a community is asking for sexuality education, um, it actually is the best response to a, a, a ministry uh, put having a pushback from higher levels. But I think that it is something that requires community level response in order to uh, a, a school. The second set of slides that I didn't try to put on the screen talk about uh, school health committees being formed at school and community level with representation of households. And I, I would always make a case that that's where that question actually has to be worked out. Does that help? Uh, yeah, I think that there's there's some there's work to do to um, to address the misconceptions about what comprehensive sexuality education, age appropriate uh, comprehensive se sexuality education looks like. There's a lot of misconceptions about that being that you know we're teaching children things that are not appropriate, but you know at five years old you're just teaching them about proper names for genitalia, about bodily autonomy and consent. So I think there's work to do to. Um, to break down some of the misconceptions that maybe parents and community members have. But thank you for that response. Thank you. Okay, one other question. Yes, at the back. Uh, hi. Uh, hello, Amelia Najros uh, from FAO. I thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I, I'm, I'm really uh, very happy to see that there is a, a huge focus on human development. Uh, uh, and uh, however, I'm a little bit surprised that neither WFP nor uh, FAO are mentioned, particularly in some efforts that they have made in uh, as far as school kitchens are concerned or school feeding or various programs like uh, GFFLS, uh, Junior Farm Field and Life Schools from FAO. I think it would have been interesting to uh, know more about it uh, because it, it involved exactly uh, uh, what you mentioned, uh, health and education. Um, and uh, if another question, a sub-question, what if there are no schools at the community levels? What, what do we do? You know, you have to, uh, you have to provoke, you have, to provoke the interest of community, and we completely agree on that. Otherwise, nothing happens if there is no behavioral change at the household level, at community level. But uh, if there is no school, how do you uh, provoke this excitement uh, of the community, as you mentioned it? Thank you. Thank you for the comment. I, uh, your point is well taken about a World Food Program and FAO and other organizations that we could talk about. I certainly uh, take, well, I, I, their presence in school feeding programs and agricultural education is profound, and I mean to include them whenever I'm referencing uh, school feeding, and I should make sure to do that in any presentation like this, that's for sure. Um, their contributions in school health have been profound. Um, as for when there are no schools at community level, 
there's a great effort in most countries where I've been working to develop community schools and have alternatives to formal schooling. And certainly uh, bilateral organizations as well as uh, multilaterals have a role to play in fostering those community schools <clears throat> which may not have the formal structure of buildings and classroom blocks that we would recognize as schools. Uh, there are also non-formal schooling opportunities through radio and other facets that uh, the same applies for the school health frameworks that uh, we could talk about and the application of uh, essential packages that may not be able to deliver services, but there certainly is scope even in non-formal radio education for education curricula. Thank you.